Find out just what the people will submit to, and you have found out the exact amount of injustice and wrong which will be imposed upon them. And these will continue until they are resisted with either words or with blows or with both. The limits of tyrants are prescribed by the endurance of those whom they oppress. And it was said by Frederick Douglass. Welcome to Surviving the Matrix, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Maxwell Egan. It's a pleasure to be with you once again, and I will be your host for the next hour. Well, folks, if the last decade or two is anything to go by, it would appear that what people are prepared to take at the hands of their leaders is virtually limitless. And so it will be interesting to see how far our leaders are prepared to take things. We've just had Barack Obama come and visit Australia, actually, and he's declared his intention to put a U.S. military base near Darwin in order to strengthen defence, of course. This is why you put military bases around the world, because you wish to make the world safe. And it would appear that according to Western logic, the way to make the world safe is to put lots of guns and nuclear weapons in as many places as possible and to appear as threatening as you are able to towards other countries. But of course, Barack Obama's visit to Australia was a little bit of a charade. I mean, after all, when he arrived, it was announced that the most powerful man in the world would be visiting Australia. But I was very disappointed because I didn't see any Rothschilds or anyone from Goldman Sachs or the Vatican on the plane at all. All I saw was the world's most famous puppet, Barack Obama. So I suppose there must have been some redefining of the word powerful in recent times that I wasn't aware of. But of course, if someone like Barack Obama can be given the Nobel Peace Prize for committing 30,000 more troops to an illegal war, then I suppose any type of perversion of the language is ultimately acceptable with these people. And I did think that the locking down of Canberra was a nice touch. I mean, after all, why allow the Australian people any freedom to move or to be anything other than the subservient animals the government likes to think of them as? And of course, it would have been a wonderful demonstration for Mr Obama to see just how well trained and passive the Australian people now are. One could almost say that if anybody ever had any doubts at the effectiveness of fluoride, they really do need only to look at the state of consciousness in a great deal of Australia, most especially Canberra. Something else that we saw in the last week was the eviction of the Occupy Wall Street group. Of course, there was a great deal of terrorist action during the eviction from the police who have proved on numerous occasions recently that they are little more than a group of domestic terrorists who are employed to defend corporate corruption. We saw the police go through there at about one o'clock in the morning, I believe. They came through with fire hoses and bulldozers and basically just pushed all the people out of the area. But I don't think that will hold sway for too long, folks. I believe that the Occupy movement is far from over, and I think that the people will probably just reoccupy the area or occupy somewhere else very close by. And for all the trepidations people may have for the Occupy movement, I do still see it as being at least some effort to display solidarity and to display some type of public unity in the face of the corporatocracy that has overtaken our governments and is currently running the world and running it into the ground headlong towards the destruction of all life upon the planet, I might add. And as I've said previously, folks, even if there are forces attempting to co-opt the Occupy movement or lead it down the garden path, I really don't believe that once this amount of people has been mobilised, that they will be effectively deviated from their prime cause. And let's face it, folks, something has to be done because we simply cannot go along in the direction that we are going. And obviously, our politicians and police are not going to do a damn thing about it. So, of course, the action that is required must come from the people. And I certainly do not think we've seen the last of the Occupy movement. 
In fact, I believe that as the global elite press forward with their plans and become more and more open with their actions, we are going to see more and more of these type of groups rise from the ranks of the public in an attempt to make a stand against what is being perpetrated against them. And folks, I think it's important for all of these groups to step back and unite with all the other groups. I've been saying this for a very long time. There are a lot of people out there addressing symptoms. There are just so many issues that are out there in the public domain at the moment. The whaling, the homelessness, the starvation, the military bases being built here in Australia, the fracking, the money system, all of these things. And you find that people get locked into tunnel vision. They can only see their own symptom and they see that as the most major problem. And they are very often very defensive towards people who perceive anything to be otherwise and will often openly belittle other groups and other people who have a difference of opinion to them. And all this ever does is create an atmosphere of division whereby no group ever becomes powerful enough to actually get anything done because they're all locked into their own little box and their own little view of how things should be managed. And a lot of what gets in the way, unfortunately, is ego. So collectively, we need to set aside this ego. We need to stand back and look at things holistically and realize that the only way any real change will ever be implemented is through a united humanity. And we need to realize that all of these problems are, in fact, symptoms of the one problem which is, as I've said so many times before, this system itself. The system is the problem. And once we address the system, then all of the machinations the system uses to enslave humanity will be laid bare and can be easily changed. Of course, the money system is the head of the snake. It isn't the problem itself, but it is absolutely the head of the snake. It is the main mechanism that has been put in place to control people. And so that is, of course, what should be dealt with first of all. And frankly, folks, the only way we're going to deal with it is through actions such as we've just seen from the Occupy movement. We absolutely need to have people on the ground standing up against this system. I mean, if the whole world was to go on strike for one day and simply turn and say enough is enough, we could change things overnight. We really could. And what prevents us from ever carrying out any action like this is, of course, the division that we are trained to believe exists between each other. And yet, even if we were to break down that division and then mount some type of action, then the further problem that we face comes from the police, those very people that we have been taught and trained to believe are there for public safety. But folks, all you have to do is look at the eviction from Occupy Wall Street to realize that nothing could be further from the truth. Because this was a peaceful occupation of caring people who wish to bring about genuine change and freedom from corporate corruption. And what did we see from our police? We saw violence and terrorism in order to defend that very same corporate corruption. And as I've also very often said, that is where one of the real battles that we face lies. It's in dealing with the mentality of modern police officers because these people have simply been trained to enforce their own slavery. And even worse than that, they've been trained to carry out acts of terrorism against anyone who should challenge it. Something very interesting about our societies folks is the way people within the societies have been trained to police the other people within the society and thereby enforce their own slavery and there should be no doubt that what we live in folks is a system of slavery we actually live in a very very low security prison where we tend to guard each other and very often we guard ourselves as well due to our fear that we have within ourselves, the fear that keeps us from standing up and being who and what we are, the fear of peer group pressure, the fear of what other people may think about what we think. And this is very important to a lot of people. Most people are very, very concerned about what others think of them. And so this creates a form of self-regulation within our psyche where we don't dare to step outside of the box for 
fear of what someone might think. I remember reading an article by the late Frank Zappa once where he described this process as undergoing a type of homemade mental nose job designed to lower the recipient's intellectual ability to the most mundane point so that they could function as one of the guys. And this truly does appear to be a very pervasive activity that is carried out within our modern societies. But again, folks, the blame cannot really be put on the people within our societies who behave in this manner. The blame really must be placed squarely on the system itself that has trained people to behave this way. And so what will it take, folks? What will it take to unite humanity and to change the direction the ship of state is currently sailing in? I've always maintained the belief that the reason the system functions the way it does and continues the way it does is due to fear and that the way to overcome this fear is to understand what reality is and how reality works. And that's why I have attempted to bring such understandings to people during the course of this program. It's why I've concentrated on energy so often. It's why I've attempted to explain to people how their body works, how you are simply inhabiting a biological computer, a vehicle that your frequency of consciousness is driving for a little while. And I also very much believe that one of the most effective tools that can be used to bring down the system of slavery that has been inflicted upon us is to realize that it's fiction. It's just an idea. It's just a meme that only really functions because people believe the meme is real. They believe in the idea that they must pay to be alive, that they must be subservient to someone else's rules and someone else's idea of what reality should be, and that they must abide by all the little rules and pieces of legislation that are handed to them by bodies such as local councils, which in fact are only there in order to prevent people from being all that they can be and from achieving all that they could achieve. I mean, you could build some structure that was wonderful, that was supporting hundreds of homeless children and being an incredible gift and source of support for your community, and the council will come along and say, oh, I'm sorry, that's 10 centimetres too wide on the eastern point. We're going to have to bulldoze it because it doesn't meet our specifications. And the problem is that when councils come and do this type of thing, we actually believe that we have to bulldoze it, that we have to do what they say because they have the local terrorists in blue uniforms there to put you in a cage if you disobey them. And what enables them to do it is because the community is divided from itself. When people see the police come and terrorise someone, they go, oh dear, look at that, I better look the other way, I better not go and help. When really what they should do is go and find out why a member of the public is being terrorised. And if there is no injured party then they should go and stand side by side with their countrymen and make a stand for what is right. And that's truly what it's going to take, folks. Nothing is going to happen until people start to stand up for themselves. Nothing's going to happen until people decide to be the change they wish to see in the world, until they begin to understand that we don't have to go by all these little rules and regulations that our employees write on pieces of paper. What we have to do is... Stand up for what is right, what is true, what is just. What we have to do is love creation and love thy neighbour as thyself, regardless of thy neighbour's religion or political persuasion or class or creed or occupation or nationality or skin colour. We have to simply love them because they are another frequency of the same consciousness to which all of us ultimately belong. They are simply another one of ourselves. And if we have a problem with their perspective of reality, then we need to look inside ourselves to find what that problem is. Because the problem doesn't lie with the one towards which you harbour ill will or ill feelings. It actually lies within yourself. And what you're being provided with is an opportunity to face that problem and to heal that inner fear. 
I mean, it's all about fear, folks. It's always been about fear. Every single system of control that's in place within this society is based on fear. The society itself is based on fear. The education system is based on fear. The social structure is based on fear. And all the division that we harbour between each other is also based on fear. Bit of a clue there, folks. Bit of a clue there as to how to deal with the situation. And it could just be that removing fear may have a lot to do with it. And that's why, ultimately, it comes down to the individual. And look, I'm not asking people to simply become aggressive personalities and go out and create situations where they will be required to stand up for themselves. I'm simply attempting to help people understand who and what they are and the latent power that exists within them that they are, for the most part, unaware of. I mean, if I'm ever approached by a police officer, I have a little bit of fun with them. I simply ask them questions, and if it gets to the stage where they begin to indicate that they are about to lapse into violence, then I will walk away. And with the people in my society, I very much attempt to lead by example. I won't rub people the wrong way, but I certainly won't take a backward step in my beliefs or my opinions. And I'll suggest things to them in a way, or simply present questions to them in a way that it's very difficult for them not to see the obvious answer. And it just kind of plants seeds within people's minds and helps them become aware of things themselves because it's much more effective when people become aware of the real situation we're facing themselves. If you can just plant enough seeds within the minds of people which may cause them to start investigating their surroundings, then they soon discover the real truths of our world. And it's much better that way, folks, because, as I've often said, real truth is not told, it is realised. The trick is to open the doors for people so that people can walk through and then realise what's going on of their own accord. Although when looking around these days, it's becoming very apparent that we're running out of time for them to do so as the plans of the globalists very much seem to be escalating, especially with what we've just seen here with Barack Obama's visit and the establishment of a military base in northern Australia. I think they're going to put 2,500 troops there to begin with, but the real number that Barack wants to put there is, I believe, 50,000. That was the original plan, but I think it was knocked back just to curb public outcry a little bit. I'm sure they'll sneak it up to that number over the next couple of years. They're very good at things like that, folks. They like to take the Fabian approach and do things in a very gradual manner. But ultimately, they always achieve the original goal, regardless of the time it takes them to do so, or the path that they need to travel in order to accomplish it. Of course, the saber rattling towards China is probably the most uncomfortable part about having an American military base here in Australia, apart from the fact that we just don't want to support that type of thing. But Barack was very insistent how it was going to mean more nuclear warships in our waters, more aircraft, and basically a large influx of weaponry to the area in order to keep the world safe, of course. And I feel so much better for him having cleared that up for me. And I suppose we can put that redefining of the word safe up there with the redefining of the word peace and the word powerful that we've also seen perverted with Mr. Obama. But then he's nothing if not consistent, folks. I do recall back in the early days of the Obama administration, he was discussing the prospect of mandatory volunteering. And after hearing someone put forth such a ridiculous prospect, then anything they do to the language from that point onwards should be hardly surprising. We're seriously not going to have much of the English language left by the end of the Obama regime, I don't think, folks. I think if Obama is elected for another term, at this rate we will probably see the redefining of every word in the English language to the point where every word we utter means the opposite of what we actually say. Although when looking at the nightly news, one might question whether such is not already the case. And one of the more remarkable things about this, folks, is that people just don't seem to notice. Especially here in Australia, people just don't seem to notice. 
Australia truly is one of the most controlled countries in the entire world, my friends. And just to see how easily the place is locked down when we have the world's most powerful puppet arrive and how willingly the people will lock themselves behind their doors and peep outside of their curtains and how willing the police are to terrorise anybody who steps outside of the lines or does anything to show any form of confidence in themselves. It really is quite remarkable, folks. And I don't support weapons at all, folks, but one of the worst things the people of Australia ever did was allow themselves to be disarmed. And what has happened to the Australian people since then? I mean, it gets to the stage where the Australia of modern times seems to be a little more than a pet shop for the elite. And it pains me to make such an observation, but looking around me, I can only judge the Australian way of life by the actions of its citizens and... Unfortunately, that is the way things seem to be these days, for the most part anyway. I mean, sure, there are many people who don't know what's going on and they simply live their lives in a blasé way. They've become accustomed to living them. But there's also a serious division that has grown up within the ranks of the Australian people. And many people are way more focused on self-service than what they used to be when I was a child. People simply just aren't the way I remember them when I was growing up. Something that seems sadly lacking in the Australian way of life and something that used to be there was the staunchness of the Australian people and their willingness to stand up for themselves and stand up for their rights and stand up for their neighbours. The good old Australian mateship, it just seems to have somehow been cast by the wayside to be replaced with some television version where undoubtedly the term means exactly the opposite of what we thought it did. And we need to get that back, folks, that mateship, that camaraderie, and not just within Australian society, but within the global society. I mean, everywhere I've ever been, I've never met anybody who wanted war. Any person from any nationality that I've spent time with, what I've found is that this is a nice person. This is a person that is just like me, that simply has a different perspective of reality. The concept that the peoples within the various countries of the world should see themselves as divided from everybody else is patently ludicrous. It truly is, because... I've never met a person that wanted to be divided from the rest of humanity. I mean, sure, many people are proud of their country, they're proud of their nationality, they're proud of the achievements of their race, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But even with that nationalistic fervor that some people have, I've never actually met anyone who wanted people from another country to die on their behalf. Sure, people are often conned into supporting wars because they believe their country is under threat from a foreign power, but usually what you find war is is either a couple of sociopaths within government arguing with each other or it's a corporate takeover and a theft of resources, which is in fact what a high percentage of wars actually are. Most wars are not fought for anywhere near the reasons that the public are presented with, most are fought simply to take control of another nation's resources and or their economy. But for whatever the reason, people can sometimes be conned into going and fighting in these wars, and they do so because they believe they're helping their country. That's the bottom line. They don't do so because they want someone else dead on their behalf. And what's important to understand about all of these wars is, as I was saying, none of them are fought for the right reasons. None of them are waged for the purposes the people are presented with. All are waged because powerful people in powerful places have powerful plans that they wish to implement, and the people are what's used to implement them. I think one of the best things that the human race could do would be to abolish the military. In fact, I think that every person in every army, in every navy, and in every air force across the globe should quit their job immediately. 
I often think what it would be like if our governments threw a war and nobody turned up. Because that's the thing, folks. They can have a war, but in order for it to function, we the people have to participate. When in fact all wars could turn into an instant state of ceasefire by a simple act of global non-compliance. It really is that simple, folks. In fact, it's so simple that people just can't see the forest for the trees. But that's the truth of the matter, folks. The truth of the matter is that the entire system remains in place because we continue to hold it up. It doesn't matter what walk of life you're from. It doesn't matter whether you're a tinker, a tailor, a police officer, a politician, a soldier, or a plumber. It really doesn't matter because... Ultimately, we're all the same. We all have the same problems, and we all have the same restrictions placed on our lives. And all of these restrictions are in place simply because we allow them to be there. Of course, we're somewhat scared into stepping outside of the lines by the terrorists in blue uniform, and yet if the entire population stepped outside of the lines, then there'd be nothing that anybody could do about it. And I think it's break time here, folks, so I'll leave it there for now, and we'll go and have a break. Thank you very much for spending this time with me today, and I'll speak to you again in a few minutes. And welcome back, folks. So yes, the world is most certainly facing some challenging times, my friends, and it really is important that the human race rise to the occasion and accept the challenges we are being offered. Because all of these challenges are in fact opportunities. These are the opportunities for freedom that we've always wanted. Many people have gone through their lives and thought, wow, I wish I was free. I wish I was free to be all that I could be. And they've never really understood why they're not. Well, folks, the reason you have never been free to be all that you could be is because of the system itself. And now that people are waking up to that, what we're being presented with is an opportunity to be free and to be all that we can be. We have before us the opportunity to create a truly wonderful world. And it is spreading. The information is getting out to more and more people and more and more people are waking up. For example, it was good to see the release of the Thrive movie the other day, which I saw as quite a valid attempt to reach the upper middle class of society, the people that believe conspiracy is all theory, the people who have really failed to ever step outside of the box. And I have great hope that the film may reach such people and cause them to question their surroundings as well. And just the fact that a film like this would have been released goes to show how many people are waking up to the urgent situation humanity finds itself in. And it is urgent, folks. It is urgent that we change the direction we are sailing in because more and more rules are being implemented, more and more globalisation is taking place. Even here in Australia, most of our food bowl and water table is being destroyed and so we're not even going to be able to grow food here in Australia. We're going to have to be dependent upon another country just to eat. And in making sure that all countries are dependent upon all other countries, Whatever you have there in your society, I guarantee that part of it, something that you're very used to or something that you are all dependent upon, comes from a source which is outside of your country. And this is the same for all countries because they want all countries to be dependent upon all the other countries. This is how globalization is being put together. It's presenting a concept of free trade to the people, but what it is actually promoting is interdependency so that no one is able to function without the system in place. And the system itself is getting more and more inhuman and more and more controlling in its every aspect. And the people really do need to wake up and pay attention to what's happening because we still have time to turn things around. But the problem is that the attacks that the human race are being subject to are escalating and multiplying by the day. And they're coming from all directions. They're coming electromagnetically, politically, legally. They're coming through the television. They're coming through 
corporatism, environmental attacks and from more insidious places such as through geoengineering. I mean, even around here, folks, I've barely seen blue sky any time in months. There's always this haze. There's always these unnatural clouds hanging around. And that's just what I see around me in the sky. But as far as society goes, the rampant attacks of corporatism that we've been subject to are literally mind-boggling. And one of the most mind-boggling parts about it is that people just don't seem to notice it. There's always new pieces of legislation being introduced by our governments. The instances of fracking and coal seam gas mining and the gas hubs these companies are attempting to set up is still a very, very big issue that we have to deal with. The Great Barrier Reef is under attack and now we have President Obama wanting to build military bases here in Australia. And this is simply an expansion of corporate control around the world, folks, and putting a military base in a place that is convenient and functional in order for the global corporation to flex its corporate muscles against the rest of the world and most especially against China. And let's not forget that it also puts them well within striking range of North Korea. But of course, China is the big prize. And the conflict that the United States and the United Nations is attempting to stir up against China has in fact been an ongoing and very predictable process for an extremely long time now. I think I remember mentioning it on a show back in 2008 or early 2009. So it's really no surprise to see a military base being put in Australia and it's most especially telling that Obama specifically mentioned China in his speech to the Australian people in which he was attempting to provide the excuse he needed to put the base there. In fact, one of the most telling things in the speech was the way Obama mentioned China in such a way as to suggest he was mentioning China simply to point out that he didn't want to mention China. I don't know, folks, it's all such theatre that we see from these people. It really has me amazed how some people simply can't seem to see through it. But you know, folks, we can change it all. We can change it all right now. And we don't need anything to do it. All we need is to understand what reality is. To understand how it works. To understand how we really interact with creation around us. To understand the higher languages we're speaking. To understand the higher senses that have been locked off to us. And even if you are still unable to access these senses, just knowing that they exist and knowing that you are speaking with these higher languages all the time makes an enormous difference to your life. I often come back to discussions of reality and discussions of energy and discussions of how the universe works and the fact that your body is simply a computer and this life is simply an experience that you're having I come back to this so often because, to me, this is the most basic and yet the most profound understanding that you can have of reality. Because when it really, really sinks in what's actually going on here, it becomes virtually impossible to feel fear. It becomes virtually impossible to feel judgment towards others. Suddenly you see everybody as being valid. And suddenly you see how easy it would be to change all of reality. And it could be done if people would just step back and spend that moment to examine things. Spend that moment to take it all in. That's the tricky part, folks. Getting humanity to stop long enough to just take a deep breath and step back and look at things from a different perspective for a moment. But I believe we can do it. I still believe we can do it. I'll never give up hope, folks. If I was to give up hope, I wouldn't be able to do the shows the way I do. I wouldn't be able to make films. I wouldn't be able to come onto the air and talk to you every week the way I do. But I continue to come on and do the shows because what I see here before me is, is like a butterfly finding its way out of the cocoon. It's a grand awakening that can only be painful by its nature because 
what we are seeing is virtually a rebirth of consciousness, and birth is always a very painful affair. But from the pain that mankind is now experiencing will come a truly beautiful new life. All it will take is mankind's participation. And it just comes back to that one simple choice between love and fear. You know, when I see the direction the earth is going, when I see the crimes and manipulation that is being carried out against mankind, when I see the state that the planet is in and the future that we are creating, and then I see how easy the answer to fixing all of these situations is, it can sometimes be an enormous frustration to me. But I know that we are on the path to recovery, on the path to self-realization, if you will. And it encourages me to go forward. But I do get a sense of frustration in seeing the brainwashed state that humanity is kept in. There's an interesting article on my website, folks, about a man who has discovered how to create free energy from a refined form of carbon. This energy can be transmitted without wires. We can collect it all in our own homes and power our houses from it. And if we don't use all the energy we collect one day, we can beam it to our neighbours free of charge. And this can basically be achieved through carbon and polymers. There's a link I've put on my website, The Future of Free Energy and Why Carbon is a Threat to the Establishment. You might want to go and check that out, folks. It's a man giving a presentation at one of the TED Talks, and I found it extremely fascinating. But this is the sort of stuff that we have. This is the sort of technology that is available to us now, and the only thing that prevents us from using this technology, the only thing that keeps the planet in the state of degradation and strip mining and warfare that it's in is the system itself and those who run the system. And this is why it's so important that humanity wake up, because we have all the technologies that we need right here, right now, to absolutely change this world for the better. And this is mainstream stuff. This is not anything that should be considered a conspiracy theory or a mystery about someone's stolen energy plans or anything like that. This is stuff that is available right now that is being presented to the world and our governments aren't implementing it because nobody's taking any notice. I mean, folks, we should be supporting these types of technologies and just putting them out there ourselves, refining these technologies, putting the information on the Internet so everybody can have it, everybody can use it, help people manufacture these sorts of things for themselves. Just get the technology out there. It doesn't matter how it's done, just get it out there because... It's people's need for energy that has been used to create so much of the tension in the world, so much shortage, so much war and bloodshed and stealing of resources, all to supposedly meet the demand for energy. And yet we have free energy available to us right now from something that is being classed by our governments as a deadly threat to mankind, namely carbon. So everything's backwards, folks, and the only way we're going to fix it is when we, the people, decide it's time to stand up and do so. That's all it would take to have a better world, folks. We have to stop listening to all the reasons that our government provides us with that explains to us why we can't simply stand up and create a better world and simply stand up and create a better world because we have the ability to do so. We just have to want it badly enough. I hate to keep beating the same drum, but the only way we're going to do this, folks, is if we remove that fear that we have that keeps us divided from each other. It's all fiction. Let it go. And let's stand up and make a better world. To be honest, folks, I'd like to see everybody participating in the Occupy events, but I'd like to see everybody occupy themselves and disconnect from the system. Non-compliance, folks. Turn away from it. Turn towards each other. You can make a difference just by changing your energy yourself and applying it to those around you. Just by seeing reality from a different perspective to the way you may have looked at it. By leading by example. By being helpful. 
by being a pleasure to be around, by putting that energy into the field, by treating others as yourself, by realizing that nobody ever really harmed you. All they did was what they were trained to do, and by seeing everybody else as valid. I've often said that one of the hardest things you will ever do is to forgive those who you believe have wronged you. But this is what has to be done. We don't need any vengeance. We don't need any heads to roll. We don't need any bloodshed. We don't need any violence at all. Sure, the police act like terrorists, but they do that because they're trained to act like terrorists. So you can't even blame them for what they do. The trick is to step back and see the matrix for what it is but then step back further and see the emotional matrix that binds it together. You've got this single consciousness that's broken into seven billion pieces and all each piece does is scream at all the other pieces and see itself as more important. But in reality we are all one. We all have the same needs and wants. We all have the same emotional extremes, the ups and downs. All we really have that's different from each other is our perspective. And all we have to do to heal all the problems that we have created for ourselves, because, folks, every problem that we see on the planet is a result of man. Man is the source of every problem that man has ever seen. And all we have to do is see that and see that all of these problems have been created through fear and division. All we have to do is step back and see it. And suddenly see other people as being just as valid as we are, realize that all we are is a perspective, the same as everybody else. And then we can heal the world, because when you have this understanding and you live your life in La Keche, and you treat others as yourself, it changes everything. I bring this type of information to you on these shows, folks, because I feel that I have a duty of care to do so. When I look around at the state of the world, when I look around at the blank looks that I see on the faces of many teenagers down the street, I really do see an urgency in mankind waking up to itself. I really do. I believe that each generation of man are, for their time on the earth, the custodians of this place for future generations. The Earth's been through thousands and thousands of years of civilization, and we've always kept the place in a pretty good state. There's always been something here for future generations to hang on to, something for them to hope for and aspire towards. But the current generation is not doing that. The current generation is, in fact, allowing the Earth to be turned into something that resembles the Moon or Mars. They are allowing the human spirit to be squashed and they are allowing the world to become a social, ecological, spiritual and physical prison. In the last 50 years, humankind has become so regimented, so repressed, so kept in check and yet people still believe that they are free. They believe they're free because they can go and purchase whatever video game they want. They can have the latest iPod and the latest fashion whenever they please, as long as they work hard enough to be able to afford to have these things. The cost of living is skyrocketing. People are kept more and more on the treadmill, but still they believe that they are free. They tighten their belts and think, well, we're just going through one of those tough cycles at the moment. But they never stop to think why these cycles exist at all. They never stop to think why they have to pay to be alive. They just never ask that question. They just think, well, of course I have to pay to be alive. Everybody has to pay to be alive. But they never ask why that is. Many people see the degradation of their surroundings as okay because it's industry. I had someone comment on one of the posts that I made that my attacking the coal seam gas hubs at are being constructed at the southern end of the Barrier Reef was uncalled for because I was attacking the last form of manufacturing we had in this country. And he actually used the word manufacturing. 
But I cannot see what is being manufactured in this case, whether it is the manufacturing of destruction of the reef, the manufacturing of the destruction of Curtis Island, perhaps the manufacturing of the destruction of the water table. Because even if fracking isn't taking place anywhere near where these hubs are being built, what these hubs are doing is supporting an infrastructure that is destroying the water table in this country. But people see these projects as good things because they see it as jobs. It's a good job and it's one of the last forms of jobs that we have, so don't take away my livelihood. And that might be all very well. I can understand and appreciate that people need jobs because they need to make a living. But the thing is that they never question why they need to work to maintain a living. Why can't they simply live in the land that was granted to them at birth due to the simple fact of them being born and live in the permaculture garden that could have been planted on that land during their time at school? just before they built their house. I mean, we could have a society that does this sort of thing, folks. We could have a society which was overseen by perhaps a council of elders that worked out the best way for society to provide for itself and to educate people for themselves and to encourage the artistic and philosophical side of each personality because these would be times of great creation and great abundance and in such societies, humanity would be free to reach its fullest potential. And these are the sorts of societies we need to construct because, unfortunately, in its present form, all the society that we currently live in achieves is to place shackles upon the human spirit and prevent us from being all that we can be in every conceivable way that it can do so. And it really does seem that that is the purpose of the system within which we live. And that's just from a simple observation, folks. I mean, when I look at what this system does to the human spirit, then that is obviously its purpose. Its purpose is to prevent humankind from being anything that it could possibly be and to hold the human spirit back as much as it possibly can. And we need to change that. The first step to changing it is to realize that that's what the system does. The second step is to Apply yourself to reality and remove the fear from your life because we have a chance to evolve our consciousness here but it's only going to work if we all choose to participate. There are a lot of people discussing the raising of consciousness and the raising of awareness that we're seeing in the world today and many people are expecting something wonderful to happen or at least hoping for something wonderful to happen. But really the way consciousness will evolve is up to the choices that people make. And ultimately it comes down to that same old choice between love and fear. We do have an opportunity to build a better world, to create a better future, to create the future that we've always wanted. We have that opportunity and we have the ability to do so. But what it takes is the participation of the people. There are many people that want to see change in the world, but they're not prepared to bring that change on themselves and to be the change that they want to see. They're not prepared to let go of that stuff they have with other people. They're not prepared to let go of the profit they like to make. They're not prepared to let go of the social status they believe they have. They're not willing to forgive and they're not willing to reach their hand out to those around them. And nothing's going to change until people begin to do these things because that is truly the only participation that we need. And it's not hard to do, folks. It's not like it's going to cost you money. It's not like it's going to cost you time or effort or inconvenience you in any way at all. All you really have to do is to change your perspective of what reality is. Change your perspective of what other people are and of what you are. Just step back and look at things holistically. Realize that science and spirituality have actually connected with each other and it's gotten to the point where reality is now virtually self-explanatory for those who 
wish to simply step back and see. The Earth is on the verge of going in one of two directions, one of corporate degradation and another of conscious evolution. The choice in which direction we will go lies with humankind as a whole. Let's not waste this opportunity. Well, that's about it for me for the show today, folks. Thank you for spending this time with me again. Thank you for continuing to visit thecrowhouse.com. There's lots of new links up there for you. And I'll look forward to speaking to you again next week. Please take care until then. In La Keshe.